West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Domestic violent extremism, or DVE. And DVE is an increasingly complex threat that is growing in the United States. Domestic violent extremism. As we battle violent extremism, foreign and domestic. To meeting the evolving threat of violent extremism. A rise of political extremism, white supremacy, domestic terrorism, that we must confront and we will defeat. Hi again, everyone. It's five o'clock in the East. The Biden administration has stressed since day one its priority to confront the growing threat of domestic violent extremism in this country. And late yesterday, it took another big step to do so as Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas announced an internal review to root out extremists in the department's ranks. In a memo to DHS staff, the secretary not holding back in his assessment, writing this, quote, domestic violent extremism poses the most lethal and persistent terrorism related threat to our country today. We will not allow hateful acts or violent extremism to penetrate the fabric of our department and fundamentally compromise our ability to protect the homeland. The New York Times describes the review this way, quote, the announcement on Monday highlights the administration's decision to prioritize combating domestic extremism after decades in which the government at times dismissed it as a minor threat or hesitated to invest additional resources to fight it. It is also a pivot from the approach taken by Donald Trump, who pressured federal agencies to divert resources to target the Antifa movement and left-wing groups, even though law enforcement authorities concluded that far-right and militia violence was a more serious threat. DHS's review follows the Pentagon's 60-day stand-down to address extremism in the military. And it comes as the country is still in a heightened threat environment due to potential violence from extremists motivated by, quote, perceived grievances fueled by false narratives. That threat appearing not to be a worry for Republicans who have emboldened many with extremist views by continuing to spew the big lie of voter fraud, the lie that incited the angry mob to storm the Capitol on January 6th and laid bare the consequences of ignoring the threats of far-right domestic extremism. The nationwide wave of restrictive voting bills has not slowed. 361 bills have been put forward so far in 47 states. That's despite new polling that shows a majority of voters are not concerned about voter fraud. Because there isn't really any. From NBC News' latest poll, people are much more concerned about making sure everyone who wants to vote is able to. And nearly three quarters of Americans are confident in their state's ability to administer a fair election where votes are counted accurately. The Biden administration showing no tolerance for extremism 
as the GOP continues pushing false narratives. This is where we start this hour with some of our favorite reporters and friends. Carol Lenig is here, Washington Post national investigative reporter and MSNBC contributor. Also joining us, Miles Taylor, former chief of staff at the Department of Homeland Security during the Trump years. He's the co-founder and advisor to the group, the Republican Political Alliance for Integrity and Reform. Also joining us, MSNBC national security analyst Clint Watts, former FBI special agent and distinguished research fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Miles Taylor, I start with you. Is there extremism at DH? Did you see any? Well, look, there's no question this is a problem, Nicole. And I would start off by saying that former President Donald Trump's dithering when it came to domestic terrorism put American lives in danger without question. Now, when it comes to the threat within the ranks of the federal government, look, when the DHS secretary says this is one of the most pernicious national security threats to the country and the most serious terror threat, the first thing you want to make sure to do is that your ranks have not been infiltrated by those individuals. Now, this isn't a political move. This is what we do when it comes to trying to screen and weed out foreign spies from our workforce, weed out international terrorists, weed out trans national organized criminals. So it is right and appropriate that the Department of Homeland Security is screening its workforce to make sure that there are not domestic terrorists who've infiltrated the department. What I will say, though, Nicole, is this. They've got to handle this with kid gloves. They've got to do it very cautiously, because if there is even a hint that there's political motivation behind this, it will undermine the cause. Now, I believe that Secretary Ali Mayorkas is going to do this in a disciplined way, but they've got to do it cautiously. If a Democrat said you have to use kid gloves to root out terrorism, every Republican I know would kill them. Do you want to elaborate on your point about kid gloves? Sorry, Nicole, I missed that. We lost you on the audio. So you said that Mayorkas has to use kid gloves in rooting out extremism in the ranks of the Department of Homeland Security. And perhaps no agent, you know this better than me, was more politicized, frankly, by Donald Trump's sadism than the one you were chief of staff to. We, we want to, I mean, I think if a Democrat used the word kid gloves in the context of rooting out terrorism, every Republican you and I both once knew would kill them. What do you mean by kid gloves? Well, I just mean he's got to handle it carefully to make sure that there's no sense of political interference in the process, because you're absolutely right, Nicole. Everything Donald Trump did with DHS was politicized, and it's why it put the country in danger. I believe this administration is undertaking these actions in an apolitical way, driven by intelligence. They just must do it carefully, because right now there's going to be Republican critics who pounce and say this review is just meant to root out people who are conservatives. I don't believe that to be the case, but uh, they've got to approach the process delicately, but it's important that they do it. This is a very big sign that the Biden administration is taking the terror threat seriously in a way that Donald Trump never did. So, Clint Watts, what does that look like when the extremists themselves associate with one political party? There aren't... um you know, I have run the video, I'm not going to do it again today, of the insurrection countless times. There aren't any Biden-Harris flags there. The insurrectionists were carrying Trump flags and Confederate flags. They weren't carrying American flags most for the most part. They were carrying Trump flags. So what is a sort of careful and surgical um, examination for extremism in their ranks look like if you cleave off political affinity? This is going to be one of the complications, Nicole, which is what is extreme speech or extreme behavior? They'll have to define that. They'll have to define it very clearly. And then really they have to enforce it universally, you know, through the ranks. The Department of Defense has been through this before. And I noticed that some of the language from the DHS memo and some of the things they refer to actually come from Department of Defense, it seems, memorandums and, and programs. When I was a young lieutenant in the 90s, we had a similar problem with white supremacy in, in the ranks. And, and we did run these sorts of programs, but it was always quite a challenge. The added challenge of this, this time, is there's no foreign terrorist organization designation process. So uh, like Miles was talking about, if we were dealing with international terrorists, if they were talking about Al Qaeda, ISIS inspired by either, that's very easy to designate and then further police. In this case, it is not. We've seen, as we've talked about on here before, overlap between law enforcement and many militia type groups. We've seen people from the armed forces and uh, law enforcement groups and other agencies show up at the insurrection. This is going to be problematic, I imagine, because as soon as they show up, 
uh, to a training, they're going to have views that oftentimes are sharing. And I can tell you just from doing law enforcement classes over the last five years, it was routine uh, when I would go into a class to see MAGA stickers or MAGA uh, phone screensavers uh, when I would go in because they definitely aligned with them. So I think the politicization, politiza- politicization of the military and law enforcement by Donald Trump has really come to fracture everything from the federal, state, and local level in terms of our enforcement agencies. So Elizabeth Newman has made this point, too. Obviously, we have a freedom to associate with whomever we want in this country, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the folks that Christopher Wray has been seemingly under the Trump administration, singularly jumping up and down, warning people about, and that's radicalized domestic violent extremists. Can you, Clint, just talk about what they'll be looking for to differentiate between just an American who happened to support Donald Trump over the last four years and someone who has potentially been radicalized? I I think it's three things, Nicole. It's probably biases. Do they have a racially motivated bias Uh, which is allowing or affecting the way they conduct their job that undermines the integrity of the agencies. It's really conduct unbecoming of the position. I I think the second part will be any sort of forming or notation of going towards violence. So when we're doing radicalization training, we usually talk about a spectrum of behaviors. Introduced to the ideology, uh, experimenting with it, fully committed to it, and then committed to violence. Those that are committed to violence, and that's what Director Ray talked, I thought, very effectively about, that category will be primary. And I think the other part that we have to look at, which is very uncommon for our country, is trying to actually undermine democratic processes, institutions, the chain of command, and the fabric of America itself. It, it's pretty bizarre that at this point in our country, they used to ask the question, have you ever been part of an organization, entity, or tried to overthrow the United States government? It was kind of a throwaway question when you'd have it on your national security uh, background check. For the first time in our country, I, I think people can't say yes, or can't say no to that. They're actually saying yes to that question. Uh, so a lot of those questions that we always took for granted is like, why would we have them in there? I think that's going to hang people up to where they're actually undermining the integrity of the democracy that they say that they're trying to enforce. I think that'll be a third category that's out there. It is Wednesday, the 28th of April of 2021, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Oh, it's just a lovely egg dish with an equally lovely velvety hollandaise sauce. Do not think anything untoward, please. Well, we uh, need a way to rid ourselves of these meddlesome priests nonetheless, don't we? So uh, the lies continue apace from the right wing. They're just making stuff up. They just don't know how to deal with Joe. (laughs) They just have to make things up. Uh, You know, the uh, I believe it was the post that uh, initially... uh, uh, had published uh, something about Kamala's book being handed out at uh, migrant children facilities, (laughs) as if that was supposed to be a bad thing. Because I got to tell you, there were some really weird books handed out during the Trump years. But, you know, that's the way they think. They did something really weird, so they think everybody must be doing it because they're normal in their own minds. Anyway, uh, so the reporter who had penned the piece uh, resigned. She said that she was forced to write the piece. So she wrote it. (laughs) And then when it got really a lot of uh, pushback, uh, she felt pretty bad and uh, up and quit. And uh, on the way out, thanked uh, everybody that she was working with because they're just a bunch of good Republicans, I guess, huh? Who have replaced the good Germans in the nomenclature of those who are quislings? And what's a quisling? Yeah, someone who just is a Vichy collaborator. What's a Vichy collaborator? (laughs) Notice how language changes. Anyway, um, some people are saying that she did a very brave thing by resigning. And I suppose one could say you could have done a braver thing by not even writing the piece. But she was young, and uh, a lot of people... Think that uh, when a superior tells them to do something, even though they think it's weird and wrong, they'll go along with it because they want to keep their job. They This is what they've been working for. 
Kind of like at least one of those uh, policemen who were uh, present holding George Floyd down while Derek Chauvin choked him off. In fact, the only one who questioned, like, uh, you, you shouldn't we be turning this guy over? You know, he's not supposed to be on his stomach. And Chauvin basically said, because he was the training officer that day, said, nah, he's good. I'm good. We're keeping him here. And the uh, young recruit went back and uh, sat on George Floyd. So at what point is that person culpable? Well, <laughs> Yeah, they expressed some concern. They thought that it went against their training. But I guess no one saw training day with Sean Penn. Oh, yeah, was, that could be more about how it really is. Or the bad lieutenant. Don't watch the bad lieutenant. That's a, I don't know. That's a rough one. Anyway, uh, bad cops make bad cops. Let's be clear, especially when they're training officers. Not enough was made of that in the trial. I wish they had been. I wish they had done that. That Derek Chauvin was the training officer during that day. And this is how you, well, choke off a black guy while the whole crowd's watching and filming it. And it's just nothing. You're just doing your job like a good Republican. Okay, well, that's only part of what's been going on in the world. And uh, Tucker Carlson still is saying, hey, <laughs> call call the cops on anybody wearing a mask, especially a kid. It's child abuse. I did come across a story where I think a 12-year-old or an 11-year-old called the cops on his parents for watching Tucker Carlson because that's child abuse. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't know what the resolution of uh, the call was. Hopefully the kid didn't get in trouble, but I think he did the right thing. If you feel like you're being abused, you need to speak up. And he did. So what's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Because we do indeed have a curated show for you today. Well, at the top, of course... You know, while uh, the DHS is reviewing, and this is across the board, the Pentagon, uh, we really need every police department precinct everywhere in America to do this as well. And that's to review the violent domestic terrorists and white nationalists within their ranks. Now, I usually call them Nazis for short. And then some people will say, you can call them a Nazi because they're not party ho card holders. Yeah, well, you know, they're Nazis anyway. Let's be clear. So uh, while that is going on, of course, there's big pushback from the Nazis in Congress. <laughs> they don't like that at all. <laughs> what? You're going to take away our constituents? Remember? Remember when the big uproar back even before Obama I think it was during GW's term when there was an assessment that came out that said, yeah, you know what? We got white domestic terrorist problems right here in America, and they seem to be a lot more immediate and a lot more dangerous than what ISIS or Al-Qaeda can rot. Okay? Especially after 9-11 when we pretty much, you know, uh, clamped down on that kind of terrorism. Oh, <laughs> some guy tried to set his shoes on fire. Everybody had to take off their shoes. Still do. So uh, uh, back then, the, the intelligence, uh, domestic intelligence communities, FBI, law enforcement said, look, you know, we got we got an Oklahoma City bombing type problem with these uh, with these terrorists, these dom white domestic terrorists. And the Republicans just went apoplectic. They said, no, you're talking about our people. You're saying our people are domestic terrorists. And, and I remember looking around all my friends saying, no, no one said that, but you are. You think that your constituents are capable of this? And you don't want them colored, tainted with the uh, the term domestic terrorists? Well, well, that's what they are. Okay. So uh, now look what's happened. <laughs> <laughs> we got him right inside of our law enforcement, our intelligence community. You know, Vlad couldn't have done any of this. Uh, he looked at what was the one political ideology in which he could influence to do even more extreme things. And guess who it was? Yeah, the Nazis in our midst. So while they are being rooted out or reviewed, 
the the same usual suspects. <laughs> the Republicans are now all up in arms saying, oh, you're, you're, you're just going to kick people out because they're conservative, which beggars the question. Are you saying that if you think someone is conservative, that they are by default also a racist Nazi? <laughs> I mean, have we come that far or did we not move very far at all? I don't think we had to move very far at all. So it was uh, it was interesting to have uh, young Miles remind all of us that uh, everything that Trump did at DHS and I would probably add and beyond was politicized everything, which uh, kind of bugs me about the census. Doesn't it bug you? I know it bugs Gunner. He's snoring about it. He's having a bad dream about the census right now. Jeez. We only had what? What? Like a fraction of, of growth over 10 years. Give me a break. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, Trump is known for cooking his own books and, you know, the census was cooked. Look at all the lawsuits and everything they did to delay it and obstruct it and really mess up the census. Well, we might be able to turn that around for our, for into our favor. Um, Senator Clyburn thinks so. Well, on the rest of the menu, marine scientists report that that the extent of DDT barrels dumped in the Pacific Ocean off Catalina Island, which is in Southern California, right by Santa Barbara, L.A., well, the amount of those barrels is staggering. Staggering. Scientists are saying that. Republicans are obstructing a bill that restores the FTC's power to seize ill-gotten gains by fraudulent companies. (laughs) I don't know. Why do they always side with the crooks? I wonder. And a Democratic nonprofit filed suits in three states as the census driven redistricting battle begins. Indeed. After the break, we move to the chef's table where two Spanish journalists and the Irish director of a wildlife foundation were killed in an ambush in eastern Burkina Faso. Uh, they were covering poaching in the region and now they're dead. Hmm. And the U.S. Special Envoy for Afghanistan pledged to press for women's involvement in the ongoing peace talks. As long as they don't end up dead. It would be nice now, wouldn't it? All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. At netrootsradio.com, to the right of the page, right there by the social media scroll, is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and Kelly does a lot more than that. Plus, she has a real life to live and bills to pay. Thank you, Kelly, for doing all that you do. If you would then look across the page near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, right there is the Patreon link. And uh, if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and if you could send us the equivalent of what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink, if you could send those funds to us once a month, we're able to stretch those funds beyond compare, indeed. And then we are able to pay our bills, which allows us to fly under the radar. And then we are able to continue this resistance broadcast that we have been broadcasting for over 10, well, 10 years. It's actually been over 10 years because it was in uh, February that we uh, celebrated the celebrated the actual 10-year anniversary of Netroots Radio. And uh, we've been able to do this because of your generosity. We take our civic duty quite seriously. That's why we do this. Uh, in our own small way, uh, we try to set the record straight and maybe uh, uh, elicit a few laughs here and there. 
indeed. So thank you for your generosity in allowing us to do so. And uh, thank you for your generosity in the future because we're not quitting. (laughs) Not yet. Okay, if you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it is so simple. You go to at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that and a whole lot more. Plus, he's got his whole busy life as well. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. You know, I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's, so you could just go there and get the show notes and links. But I also post it on uh, uh, social media platforms, including Twitter. And I do. I try to do that about ten minutes before showtime. We might leak in a little bit to the uh, the uh, introduction that we have at the top of the show. But I do get those show notes and links out there, and they are truly an integral part because that is where the true reportage is. So uh, check them out. Okay, follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West, and please, please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found, because they're everywhere. Everywhere. We're not on Spotify, I don't think. Maybe I should get on there. Might try to make this into, uh, I don't know, a moneymaker? That wasn't necessarily the idea at the beginning. You notice how... Liberal causes don't really make a whole lot of money unless you shave corners here and there. But, boy, they love throwing money at fascism. I don't know why. It's always been that way, too. It's kind of bothersome. Anyway, speaking of bothersome, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, comes out of the Associated Press by Julie Watson, and it is scary because I have sailed, I have surfed, I have scuba dived, I have snorkeled all through those that stretch of uh, of ocean. In fact, one of the lifeguard workouts and a test was to swim to Catalina Island and back from Huntington Beach. Okay, not not an easy thing to do, but uh, it can be done if you know what you're doing. But I'm just saying that this is a scary, scary story. Marine scientists say they have found what they believe to be more than 25,000 barrels that possibly contain DDT dumped off the, south, off the southern California coast near Catalina Island, where a massive underwater toxic waste site dating back to World War II, has long been suspected. The 27,345-barrel-like objects were captured in high-resolution images as part of a study by researchers at the University of California, San Diego's Scripps Institution of Oceanography. They mapped more than 56 square miles of seafloor between Santa Catalina Island and the Los Angeles coast in a region previously found to contain high levels of the toxic chemical in sediments and in the ecosystem. You know, the fish we eat. Historical shipping logs show that industrial companies in Southern California used the basin as a dumping ground until 1972. Oh, How nice. I was a junior then. And guess what else I was? A lifeguard swimming in the ocean. I was also a surfer surfing in the ocean. Oh, did I tell you that I was also a member of our high school scuba diving club? And where do we go scuba diving? Off Catalina Island. Well, the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act, also known as the Ocean Dumping Act, was enacted, and that's when they stopped dumping it in 1972, as far as we know. Disposing of industrial, military, nuclear, and other hazardous waste was a pervasive global practice in the 20th century, according to researchers. Really? You don't need to research it. All we have to do is remember it. We were all there. I mean, that's the whole reason why we had Earth Day. Stop 
poisoning the river. Stop poisoning the ocean. Stop poisoning the air. And everybody's going, well, we have to throw mercury and all these tailings into this tiny little river so we can get what little bit of gold is left. I hear that still to this day. Resting deep in the ocean, the exact location and extent of the dumping was not known until now. The survey provides a wide area map of where the barrels are resting, though it will be up to others to confirm through sediment, sediment sampling that the containers hold DDT. It's estimated that between 350 and 700 tons of DDT were dumped in the area, uh, which is 12 miles from Los Angeles and 8 miles from Catalina Island. The long-term impact on marine life and humans is still unknown, said Scripps chemical oceanographer and professor of geosciences Lahini Aliwari, who in 2015 co-authored a study that found high amounts of DDT and other mad-made chemicals in the blubber of bottlenose dolphins that died of natural causes. Scientists conducted the survey from March 10th to March 24th, following a Los Angeles Times report last year about evidence that DDT was dumped in the ocean. Unfortunately, the basin offshore Los Angeles has been a dumping ground for industrial waste for several decades, beginning in the 1930s. Scientists started the, cer the search where University of California Santa Barbara professor David Valentine had discovered concentrated accumulations of DDT in the sediments and spotted 60 barrels about a decade ago. High levels of DDT have been detected in the area's marine mammals, and the chemical has been linked to cancer in the local sea lion population. Reuters brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Republicans at a hearing in the U.S. House of Representatives to discuss restoring the Federal Trade Commission's ability to claw back ill-gotten gains from companies deemed deceptive voiced doubts about quickly passing a bill unless it put some limitations on the agency. Representatives Gusabilla Raka said at a hearing before a panel of the House Energy and Commerce Committee that the FTC had a history of overreach without elaborating and urged that guardrails be put into the legislation. Representatives Neil Dunn and Greg Pence also urged guardrails be added to the bill, but did not say what they were, although there was discussion at the hearing regarding a statute of limitations of wrongdoing. What? The bill can pass the House of Representatives without Republican support, will, but will need some Republicans in the Senate, which requires 60 votes to end debate and move to a vote. The hearing was called in the wake of a Supreme Court decision last week that made it more difficult for the FTC to win back lost funds by ruling that the agency was misusing a measure to stop bad behavior, not recover money. Ah, uh, in a world where civil asset forfeiture of your car is common. All right, let's just be clear about that, Kavanaugh. Representatives Tony Cardenas, along with other Democrats, have introduced a bill to restore that ability. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce has also opposed the bill as it stands. Acting FTC Chair Rebecca Slaughter argued in the hearing that the agency had 24 federal court cases based on the 13B authority that was a subject of the Supreme Court ruling. The cases could return $2.4 billion to affected consumers. Among the active cases in an FTC fight with Narium International, an alleged pyramid scheme later known as Neora and Lending Club, which advertised no hidden fees and then charged 
hidden fees. It also includes four antitrust cases, including one in which jailed pharma bro Martin Scarelli is accused of breaking antitrust law to push up the price of a life-saving drug. Joseph Axe of Royers brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. A National Democratic Redistricting Group has brought a trio of lawsuits in Pennsylvania, Minnesota, and Louisiana, asking courts to prepare to step in if the divided government in each of those states fails to agree on new legislative maps. The litigation, filed after the U.S. Census Bureau released data on Monday showing how many congressional seats and electoral colleges college votes will be allocated to each state for the next decade is the first salvo in what will likely be a sprawling national court battle over redistricting. The nonprofit National Redistricting Action Fund, which is affiliated with former Attorney General Eric Holder's National Democratic Redistricting Committee, brought the lawsuits on behalf of several individual voters in each state. While these are the first lawsuits of this new election cycle, let me make this point. These are not going to be the last, said attorney Mark Elias, who represents the group and last year led the campaign to defend Joe Biden's presidential win. And that was a legal campaign, by the way. Both Pennsylvania and Louisiana have Democratic governors who can veto maps produced by their Republican-controlled legislators. In Minnesota, Democrats hold the governorship and the state house, while Republicans control the Senate. The lawsuit asks state courts to set a schedule to take over the process and draw new maps in the likely event that state officials reach impasse. You know, in Oregon, what the Republicans do is they just don't show up. They hide out in other states. And then the governor has to threaten sending the state cops after their asses. This is the kind of impasse we're talking about. Elias noted that the redistricting process is compressed this year due to months of delays at the Census Bureau and said the intent of the suits was to ensure courts have enough time to produce fair maps. Adam Kincaid, the executive director of the Republican counterpart to the NDRC, the National Republican Redistricting Trust, dismissed the litigation. The lawsuits are expensive press releases that likely aren't going anywhere, he said in an email. Yeah, well, tell it to the guy who was 62 to six. Yeah, 62 and one. Tell it to that guy, Mark Elias. Come on. Both parties are readying for a fierce contest over redistricting. Sometimes we like to call it gerrymandering. The once a decade process by which states redraw their electoral maps for congressional and state legislative districts based on the census count. You know, the census that Trump actively effed up. Texas, Florida, and North Carolina, all states where Republicans have pursued gerrymandering, in which one party deliberately manipulates the map to create political advantages, gained a total of four House seats on Monday and uh, when the U.S. Census Bureau released its initial 2020 data. During a briefing for reporters, Holder explicitly tied the coming fight over redistricting to the ongoing conflict over Republican efforts to install voting limits in dozens of states. 
I have no doubt that the same Republican legislators who have pushed these bills will now try to use the redistricting process to illegitimately lock in power for that party for the next decade, he said. Indeed. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, The Real Urban Cowboy. Unlike the 1980 film with this title, the meaning here is more literal. For most, thoughts of guys on horseback in film turn to John Wayne types. In actuality, though, about a quarter of Old West cowboys were black, few of whom are ever depicted in movies. And this doesn't even consider the many African Americans who dealt with horses in cities, which is where Concrete Cowboy picks up. Set in the present day, this one's a drama set in Philadelphia's Fletcher Street Stables area, one of the few remaining inner-city stables. Shot on location with several real-life neighborhood riders cast in minor roles, the movie tells the story of Cole, Caleb McLaughlin, who's sent away for a summer to live with his estranged father, Harp, played by Idris Alba, who's also a producer here. Cole, who knows little about his father and even less about horses, is at first eager to leave this strange world. He soon befriends Schmush, a teenage drug dealer who also wants out, but who has a plan which reflects his ties to the community. Indeed, at the heart of this film are the ties that the characters, including Cole eventually, have to their under-threat way of life. If there's a villain in Concrete Cowboy, it's gentrification, which, like in many places, risks pushing low-income residents out of the community communities they have inhabited for generations. In a nod to real life, the producers of the movie have set up fundraising to maintain a nonprofit urban writing center in the area where they filmed. The blurring of fiction and reality allows Concrete Cowboy to ultimately be seen as a redemption tale, not just in regards to the plot, but also to a way of life in danger of becoming a memory. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Jason Goldman. Really, for probably most of a decade, you know, it seemed to be during the hot summertime where my students would come back into the building and knock on my door and say, hey, do you, you see the lovebirds in the, you know, the windows and the vents? You know, and I said, yeah, I, I have. And, and they'd say, well, what, what do you think they're doing? Why are they, why are they there? And, you know, maybe they're cooling down or, or you know, avoiding, you know, something. And I said, well, that, that sounds really interesting. Maybe we should do a study on it. Arizona State University biologist Kevin McGraw typically studies the way animals, including birds, use color as a way to communicate. But he couldn't resist the avian mystery just outside the office door. After hearing about the birds perching on campus buildings year after year, he decided to enlist the help of some undergraduate students to figure out what they were up to. Rosy-faced lovebirds are a type of parrot native to the arid parts of southwest Africa, like Namibia's Namib Desert. Probably due to the pet trade, they became established in Phoenix, Arizona around 35 years ago. In their native range, they usually stick to natural areas. But in Phoenix, they seem to prefer urban areas, like the ASU campus. You know, it's, it's the hottest city in North America here in Phoenix, and you know, there aren't a lot of microsites natively in the desert where you can you can so-called hide or, in this case, cool down. Some of the older buildings on campus have inefficient cooling systems that release cooled air into the environment. It's bad for energy efficiency, but good for the birds. Even though rosy-faced lovebirds live in Phoenix year-round, the researchers found that they seek out the air conditioning relief vents only between June and October. And they're most likely to do it on the hottest days that exceed 99 degrees Fahrenheit. 
The results were published in the journal Biology Letters. Even this desert-adapted bird has a thermal tolerance limit, and the sweltering Phoenix summer, exacerbated by the urban heat island effect, often surpasses it. These obviously aren't the first animals to take advantage of the built environment. Plenty of birds seek out buildings for nesting or roosting, for example. But in those cases, the built environment is providing a replacement for a natural habitat that's gone missing. That's not quite what's happening here, says ASU undergraduate student Regan Mills, who led the study. Well, it wasn't that they were just moving into these spaces because the previous spaces that were there had been taken away. It was they're finding this interesting new opportunity to serve some sort of like thermoregulatory function. The researchers say this may be the first formal documentation of an animal population taking advantage of building infrastructure for cooling. For me, the, the big takeaway is we're our human responsibility when it comes to like the rise in global temperatures and how we're pushing these animals to adapt to that in really novel, interesting ways. Like birds don't typically, the wild birds don't typically like to be close to people. Once the pandemic restrictions allow them to return to campus, Mills and McGraw hope to continue their study of these birds. One thing they'd like to understand is whether the introduced lovebirds are outcompeting native birds for access to this cooling resource, or whether native species have found other strategies for surviving the hottest days. We have, I think, a pretty significant moral responsibility to understand the ways that we're causing native animals to interact with us. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Jason Goldman. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The discovery of penicillin in 1928 by Alexander Fleming was one of the greatest scientific achievements of the 20th century. It's hard to imagine a world before the development of what many consider to be miracle drugs. However, just 90 years ago, antibiotics weren't available. Thanks to antibiotics, some common illnesses such as strep throat are now easily treated, whereas in the past they often led to serious complications. Antibiotics serve an important role in keeping you and your loved ones healthy, but it's important to remember that antibiotics only treat bacterial infections. Most common infections such as colds, flu, most sore throats, bronchitis, and many sinus and ear infections are caused by viruses and do not respond to antibiotic treatment. These infections can be overcome by simply treating the symptoms and letting the illness run its course. Unfortunately, antibiotics have often been overused, resulting in decreased effectiveness and an increase in antibiotic-resistant diseases. Antibiotic resistance, or the increased ability of bacteria to survive in the presence of antibiotics, has become a major public health threat that we all need to help fight. When a person takes antibiotics, they are at risk for possibly having a bad reaction to these drugs. Some side effects can be quite serious, or even life-threatening in the case of an allergic reaction or severe diarrhea. This is why it is very important to only use antibiotics when they are absolutely needed and not for viral infections. Talk to your healthcare professional about the best treatment for your illness. If it is caused by a virus, follow his or her recommendation for treating the symptoms. Learn more about appropriate antibiotic use and how to feel better when you don't need an antibiotic by visiting CDC's Get Smart Know When Antibiotics Work website at cdc.gov slash getsmart slash community. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power.
A Texas-sized voter suppression bill is pending in Texas. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. The proposed voter suppression legislation targets metropolitan areas where many of the state's black and brown voters live, Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, and Austin, because its provisions only apply to counties with a population of a million or more. For example, Harris County, which includes Houston in 2020, had a 70 percent voter turnout with no evidence of fraud. One reason for the high voter participation was the availability of 24-hour voting at eight sites on one day, the Thursday before the election. That allowed people who worked late or night shifts or two or three jobs to vote. 24-hour voting worked great. So this legislation says never again. Another reason for the high voter turnout was the 127,000 Harris County voters who used drive through voting sites because they couldn't stand in line for hours or because of disabilities or pregnancy or health concerns or other reasons. drive through voting worked great, so this bill says never again. Another makes it more difficult to remove poll watchers who are intimidating would-be voters. The list of racist voter suppression provisions goes on. Raising the issue, first Georgia, now Texas. And so when it comes to voting, how many states will Jim Crow take over again? The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1971. That was the day the Occupational Safety and Health Act went into effect. At the time, it was estimated that 14,000 workers died annually on the job, 2.2 million workers were permanently or temporarily disabled, and a half a million developed occupational diseases each year. It was estimated that at least 25 million serious injuries and deaths went unreported each year. Many of the standards, regulations, and enforcements OSHA now has have come as a result of intense, continuous pressure waged by the labor movement. The Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union was the first to test out the new bill when they filed a complaint against the Allied Chemical Company in Moundsville, West Virginia in May of 1971. Among the many hazards at the facility, pools of mercury on the shop floor were common occurrences. OSHA issued its first citation against Allied Chemical under the General Duty Clause. The first OSHA standard issued came a year later for asbestos. Today, the AFL-CIO notes that for the year 2015, 4,836 workers were killed on the job. There is only one OSHA inspector for every 76,000 workers, and on average, it would take OSHA 145 years to inspect every workplace in the country. But new rules protecting workers from silica dust and beryllium have been established, as have strong reporting and record-keeping standards. There are stricter coal dust standards and anti-retaliation protections for workplace whistleblowers. The Trump administration is currently looking to overturn all of it. You can take action this Workers' Memorial Day to protect working conditions on the job by finding an event in your area by going to aflcio.org. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 39 degrees Fahrenheit. It's still a little chilly. Expecting a high, though of about 82 so fancy that uh be careful don't catch pneumonia that's how it happens 
And uh, yeah, so that's uh, much warmer than yesterday, consider- considerably. So we'll have sun and clouds mixed. Winds will be light and variable with partly cloudy skies tonight. Lows in the upper 40s, so not as chilly as they have been. Winds remaining light and variable. Partly cloudy skies tomorrow, Thursday, with a high around the mid 80s. And winds will be out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County have been updated with the weekend totals plus yesterday or up to yesterday. And confirmed cases in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon now stand at 10,329 with 129 deceased. Grass pollen is rated as moderate here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 26 parts per million. And that daytime UV index has ticked down one notch to six, but that is still in the high range. So do still take care. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.33 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles and relative humidity is at 85%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 51 degrees with rain showers. Uh, Paris is 66 and sunny. Rome is 67 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 57 and fair. Kabul is 69 degrees and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 70 and cloudy. Tokyo is 66 with rain showers. Sydney, Australia is 62 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 52 and sunny. And New York, New York is 65 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. Sam Mednick and Aritz Para of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Two Spanish journalists and the Irish director of a wildlife foundation were killed in an ambush ambush in eastern Burkina Faso, the Spanish government, and officials in the African country said yesterday, Tuesday. The two journalists were working with the wildlife campaigner on a documentary about poachers in a national park bordering Benin when they were attacked by gunmen, Spain's foreign minister said Tuesday in a press conference in Madrid. The Spanish journalists were David Berrain, age 44, and Roberto Frail, age 47, both from northern Spain, said members of the Reporters Without Borders organization, representing the two reporters' families. Berrain was conducting early research for a documentary project on how Burkina Faso authorities are tackling poaching, also focusing on communities of people living in the park, according to media content producer Movistar Plus or Movie Star Plus. The company identified the Irish victim as Rory Young, director of the Shingeta Wildlife Foundation. At the time of the attack, the three men were traveling with an anti-poaching patrol with about 40 people. The Irish government said it was aware of reports and is liaising closely with international partners regarding the situation on the ground. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. 
Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. The special envoy for Afghanistan, Zalmay Khalilazad, said on Tuesday yesterday that President Joe Biden's administration would press for meaningful participation for women and minorities in the ongoing peace talks. As Biden prepares to withdraw U.S. forces by September 11, uh, Khalilazad said in a prepared remark for a Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing, the administration is working to preserve civil rights and impressing upon the Taliban there will be severe consequences to civil war with the cooperation of neighboring countries and other U.S. partners. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on. And we're going to meet up tomorrow and probably talk about Joe's, uh, is it a State of the Union? Is that what they're calling it? Well, we'll speak about Joe's speech tomorrow on Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here. In West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert. Des dentelles et des TL, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver